it's time to complete our first trilogy of Simpsons science episodes. In the past, we've taken a look at the science behind some of the earlier Simpsons with two cars in every garage and three eyes on every fish, and the science behind the Simpsons big screen debut in the Simpsons movie. Today, we're jumping back to the golden age of the Simpsons, season 6 to be specific, looking at one of the many Simpsons go on a trip to blank episodes, complete with games of Knifey Spoonie and Chaz Wazzers. Hello everybody and welcome back to another episode of The Science Of, where I slowly overanalyze your favorite game shows and more. Today, we're back in Springfield to take a look at the science behind Bart vs Australia. This season 6 episode was written by the writing team of Bill Oakley and Josh Weinstein, and originally aired in February of 1995. As mentioned earlier, this is one of many episodes where the Simpsons travelled abroad and hilarity ensues. The main plot of this episode revolves around Bart trying to find out what direction the drain flows around the world. In the show, the difference in drain direction between the Northern and Southern Hemisphere is put down to something called the Coriolis Effect, but it's never described in the episode proper. So what we're going to do in this episode is jump deep into the science behind the Coriolis Effect and see if it actually works like Weinstein and Oakley said, or whether this science is as real as the proud nation of Rand McNally. So what is the Coriolis Effect? Well, in simple terms, the Coriolis Effect makes things like planes, travelling for long distances around the world, appear as though they're moving in a curve rather than in a straight line. The reason behind this is very simple. The Earth is a globe rotating on a 23 degree axis, and as such, different parts of the Earth move at different speeds, dependent on their distance from the Earth's equator. But that's a bit of a simplification, and the Coriolis Effect is a bit different to other physical concepts discussed on the channel. But first, let's see how the Coriolis Effect is described in the episode. In the Northern Hemisphere, water always drains counterclockwise. It's called the Coriolis Effect. This isn't exactly accurate. The Coriolis Effect isn't a force, even though it's occasionally referred to as one. This is most likely owing to the Coriolis Effect describing how the rotation of the Earth is able to steer winds and surface ocean currents. The Coriolis Effect causes the path of free moving bodies to appear to curve, with water in the Northern Hemisphere curving surface currents to the right and bending surface currents to the left in the Southern Hemisphere. The Coriolis Effect might explain why weather and oceans flow in their clockwise and counterclockwise currents, but the same can't be said for toilets and sinks described in the episode. The Coriolis Effect has virtually nothing to do with water swelling down a drain, as it's far too weak to have any effect on a short-lived phenomena of small basins of water under normal conditions. The reason behind the swirl of a plug is that water starts off with some manner of motion before opening the drain. And whilst this motion might be too small for you to notice, as the water moves towards the drain, its rotational motion will get amplified and it will start swirling faster. You can actually see this for yourself. All you need to do is fill up a sink with the plug in and then stir the water in one direction, clockwise, anticlockwise doesn't matter. Then leave the water until it's hardly moving and open the drain. You should notice that the water drains out in the direction that you stirred it, and to make sure, stir the water in the opposite direction to see if it drains the same way. In order to see this effect clearly, you might have to put something in the water, but even if you wait an hour or so after stirring the water to drain it, you should still get the same amplification of the movement. The reason for this amplification is a quantity known as angular momentum. Angular momentum is the product of three qualities, the mass of an object, the radius of the spinning object and the angular velocity of the object. The key to angular momentum is this. If there is no external force pushing or pulling on a spinning object, then its angular momentum will stay the same. And this means that the momentum needs to be conserved for the water at the outer edge of the sink as it is the centre of the sink. And this is why the water's angular velocity increases in the centre, as there is less water than at the edge. Surprise, surprise, this phenomenon is known as the conservation of angular momentum. So now we know that unfortunately, regardless of whether you're in America or Rand McNally, your drains are going to swirl in a random direction, dependent on a huge number of factors that have absolutely nothing to do with the Coriolis effect. The same goes for hurricanes, which are impacted by the movement of air, moving towards low pressure regions at the centre compared to high pressure at its exterior. But this isn't the only science hidden behind the goofy antics of Homer and Bart's escalation of Aussie-American relations. The episode also features a subplot where Bart introduces a bullfrog into the Australian ecosystem. War? That's an odd name. I ought to call them Chazwazers. Given that this is The Simpsons, this naturally results in the incredible destruction of the Australian ecosystem that can only occur by introducing a foreign species into a new environment. 
Whilst this might seem like a bit of an unusual subplot, especially for an episode featuring the main threat of Bart being kicked up the ass with a giant boot, it's actually in reference to a very real impact that the introduction of non-native toads into Australia had upon its ecosystem. You see, cane toads are native to South and mainland Middle Australia, but back in 1935, they were introduced to Australia from Hawaii by the Bureau of Sugar Experimental Stations in an attempt to control the population of the Australian native grey-backed cane beetle. You see, these beetles are detrimental to sugarcane crops, and these are a major source of income for Australia, with between 80 and 85% of Australians' raw sugar being sold abroad making Australia the second largest sugar exporter in the world. And these beetles eat the leaves of the sugarcane crop, and more importantly, beetle larvae eat away at the roots. Now normally, to help solve this problem, you'd use some kind of pesticide, but the eggs of the larvae were often buried deep underground, so conventional methods of pest control wouldn't do. So in 1935, 102 cane toads were imported to Australia, being used to breed 62,000 toadlets in captivity, which were then released around varying areas of Australia. Now you might think that that was a lot of toadlets being spawned, and you would be right, but since their release in 1936, these toads have now multiplied to populations where there are as many as 200 million toads. So there are now a ton of toads, but was their impact on the Australian ecosystem as severe as the bullfrogs Bart introduced in that episode, which go on to eat all of Australia's crops? Well, the cane toads have been linked to some pretty significant changes to Australia's ecosystem, owing to four main qualities that threaten biodiversity. First and most important of these is that the cane toads are toxic at all stages of their life cycle from eggs to adults, meaning that their ingestion can kill native predators. In fact, cane toads have been linked to the decline of several natural predator species in the Northern Territory of Queensland, such as the Northern Quoll and Gonus. But the cane toad isn't just prey. It's able to eat almost anything it can swallow, including household scraps, meat, pet food, and eating most insects in very large qualities, not being fussed between beetles, bees, or even larger organisms like other native frogs, smaller toads, and some species of mammals, and even snakes. But it's not only the food chain where the cane frog is a threat to biodiversity, they're also incredibly adaptive, thriving in urban and disturbed areas in a way that many species can't, allowing them to breed quite quickly. And not only can they survive in unlikely areas, but they're also incredibly competitive with native species for both food and habitats, with an incredible appetite that depletes food sources for a large variety of animals, specifically other native frogs and toads. It's no way near as deadly as the crop clearing toad scene at the end of the episode, but it could still prove a significant risk to Australia's ecosystem. So there we go. Bart vs Australia for an episode on the surface is just another Simpsons go on a holiday and hijinks ensue episode holds a lot of interesting references to Australian science, and even though it got the concept of the Coriolis effect wrong, it does open some room for interesting discussions about whether you need to waste resources on an American pump to make water flow in the opposite direction when you could just stir the water with a presidential bog spoon to achieve the same effect. Then on top of that, you have references to very real ecological worries, bringing light to something that I bet 99% of viewers wouldn't have gotten at the time, let alone most of the viewers watching it a good 25 to 30 years later. Naturally, when it comes back to looking at the science behind The Simpsons, whether it be movies, episodes, or comic books, there's always a little bit of room for interpretation, as The Simpsons is above all else a comedy. As always, if you enjoyed this video, then don't forget to leave a like, comment, and subscribe to the channel. And if you want to help combat the ever-changing and frustrating YouTube algorithm, then make sure you share the video to help my channel grow. If you have any scientific subjects or topics that you'd like to see me cover in the future, then please tell me in the comments down below. As well as that, follow me on Twitter to get updates on the latest science of videos, and join my Discord for chats about science, gaming, and more. But until then, this has been the Science of the Simpsons. I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching. If you're looking for game based content, then you can join me over on Twitch, where I livestream three times a week playing all manner of games suggested by the community. Or if you want to support the channel even further, then you could also contribute to my Patreon, where you'll get behind the scenes access to the creation of all videos as well as being able to vote on what the next science of video will be.